So it's a great uh, pleasure for me to introduce uh, the Reverend Dr. Bruce Kay, uh, who's with us this evening. Uh, Bruce has taught at Durham University and the University of New South Wales. Uh, he was the Master of New College at the University of New South Wales from 1983 to 1994. Uh, he was General Secretary of the Anglican Church of Australia from 1994 uh, to 2004. Uh, he was the founding editor of the Journal of Anglican Studies and a member of the Inter-Anglican Theological and Doctrinal Commission. Uh, he's published extensively and uh, you know, endless articles and um, a terrific number of books. Um, and particularly, he's written a lot about Anglicanism. Um, Bruce is currently an adjunct research professor in the Centre for Public and Contextual Theology at Charles Sturt University and was made a member of the Order of Australia in 2005. Bruce's most recent book, uh, published by Coventry Press, and terrific uh, to have Nikki Douglas with us from um, Coventry. Um, his most recent book, uh, Living with COVID, is a collection of 50 short reflections written over the course of 12 months uh, from March 2020 to March 2021. Um, they were reflections that started their life in a parish newsletter. The reflections give insights into how individuals and communities and nations uh, were navigating this strange terrain of the pandemic. And they provide um, a real snapshot of a particular time. Um, but as well as offering a snapshot of, of that one year, they also offer uh, something much more than that. And they offer plenty of insights into how Christians in particular uh, might live in the light of the pandemic. So welcome, Bruce, and thanks for, for giving us some time this afternoon. And, uh, and as I said, the Reflections started their life in a parish newsletter. Um, but you want to talk a bit more about how, how the book came to be? Well, it started, uh, as you say, in 2020, is that right? Yes. Uh, when the pandemic began. And in our parish, we used to have a short newsletter that went out by email to most people. Uh, and uh, when the pandemic came on, it became clear that more communication was needed. So it developed into an email, an email de delivered community news which was just a long document with all sorts of stuff in it notices about services and community things and just information to try and help through the COVID um, and our rector Stuart Robinson who used to be the Bishop of Canberra Goldman uh, said to me look why don't you write three or four hundred words every week for the um, parish the community news and I said oh that sounds like a good idea um, it actually turns out to be quite a lot of work, but uh, uh, so I wrote every week for a year, um, three or four hundred words. Um, and it wasn't particularly planned. Uh, I kind of thought about what I might write for the week and then um, wrote about it, depending on what was happening. So it was very much affected by what was happening in the week in relation to the COVID thing, because it was all addressed to the context in which people uh, were trying to live. And it was mainly mainly addressed to our, our own community in the church, uh, but it went elsewhere. The, the email distribution went up to a couple of hundred during the course of the COVID, not because of my column, but because it was all just a good news bulletin. Yeah, that's how it happened. Well, then the, the kindly Hugh McGinley from, uh, uh, from Melbourne at Coventry uh, I bumped into him at uh, a funeral and uh, we had a chat and renewed con contact, but then uh, we got into conversation about this project um, last, early this year, I think, or last year. And uh, he said, well, with a bit of tidying up, this would be good. <laughs> so we took the dates out and um, he went through it and helped it. Uh, and here you have it. So it's a kind of, um, it's a gift from Hugh and a gift from Stuart Robinson, and I just did the slate work. Um, Bruce, it's interesting, you know, reading the book, 
as I said, it, it, it does give a real snapshot of a particular moment in time. And, and as I read it, you know, things like the Black Lives Matter protests and thinking hopefully about the possibility of a vaccination and um, snap lockdowns and, and Donald Trump uh, and even closed churches, you know, it, it was a particular moment in time. Um, what is it about our tradition that enables us to take, you know, the, those things that happened at that one time and, and sort of lift our eyes to another horizon so that we can read those things and get something out of them, uh, you know, 12 months on, two years on? Yes, uh, I guess um, I, think, I think dealing with COVID is like dealing with life in concentrated and sharpened form. And the kinds of things that I wrote were the kinds of things, if I'd been a lot smarter and stimulated by things around me more than a COVID does, you might say about the ordinary, ordin the ordinary circumstances of life. We run into crises, we face difficulties of one kind or another, but COVID actually magnified them and sharpened them up. And I think what I was doing was trying to remind people about basic things about our Christian faith and seen out of the lens, my lens of my Anglican faith, uh, as to how we live as Christians. So it was about, really about the, in my mind, it was about the kind of the ordinary standard things about living Christian life uh, and learning to live a Christian life. I, I, I guess I was quite moved by conversations with people in our church community who, who reveal a capacity to do sensible and good things to sustain their faith in the, in the absence of church services, for example, at one stage. And I guess I was trying to encourage, I was trying to encourage that kind of um, approach to Christian living. So, so for some people there was, you know, there's a rediscovery of, of some uh, spiritual practices, as you said, you know, people who were able to, to rediscover so, some of those things. But is there a particularly Christian response to, uh, to that, that period of, of COVID that um, you would say, you know, marks it as different to, to other traditions? In the Anglican tradition, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I think different traditions provide different things for these kinds of circumstances. I mean, the Roman Catholics have a very strong institutional framework, uh, much stronger than you find in Anglicanism. And I guess that's a sustaining thing. And, and remarkably, because of a variety of elements in that church, they can survive, even though church is a much more central demanded kind of activity in their tradition institutionally. Um, I'm not sure. In the Anglican case, I think what helps us is that we have a, a kind of tradition of institutionality, services, lectionary, church year, um, parish life, which has a certain kind of shape and structure to it. But, but they are, how can I put this, not written in stone. They're kind of there to serve other advantages so that in even in the old preface to the prayer book it talks about things being done decently in order for growing the christian faith and so forth i can't remember the exact words but so institutions come and go in a way um so we have a kind of i think probably in varying degrees across the spectrum of our church uh, a, a possibility of a slightly more flexible approach to some of our our framework things and that's a great help in my view because it, it actually helps you to realize that these things are there not for their own purposes but for the purposes of encouraging and developing Christian character in individuals and communities and that's the plus I think and I think a lot of people discovered that during COVID. And there was that interesting uh, moment where um, we suddenly pivoted to, to online worship when churches were closed because we couldn't gather and I think for many people discovered that we can sit quite lightly with our buildings. Uh, and yet, you know, here we are um, at 
at this end of things, we're you know, firmly embedded uh, and cemented back into our buildings. And so, you know, it sort of gave us a taste of, of all sorts of things, but we're drawn back to the familiar and, and the safe. Um, what was your experience of, of that? Yes. Well, we, of course, are not entirely back in our churches uh, down here, or at least in our parish anyway. Um, I, I share that view. I think, I think it was quite dis disorientating not to go to church on Sunday. Um, bear in mind, I'm retired, so I don't have, I preach once a month in our church, but that's it. Um, so I'm a parishioner ordinarily. Um, and I noticed that when we had Zoom church, we didn't have singing. And yet singing has always been a very uh, powerful emotional experience of church services, to me anyway, and I think to most people. And without thinking much about it, as soon as the Zoom service was over, uh, my wife and I used to sit down and watch songs of praise on the television <laughs> so that we could kind of join in this kind of much more directly uh, the tradition of hymn singing. I think that was one thing that uh, we missed and had to find an alternative for. Um, the other thing, of course, which Zoom kind of provided, but not all, was kind of, was, was what happens after church in an ordinary way, where you, where you um, meet up and re-establish connections and, and there's a kind of community formation taking place in church, which is in, in after church, which is over morning tea or whatever. Um, and and in our parish, morning tea often went on beyond longer than the service. Uh, and 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 in one of the churches, which is now in our parish, morning tea is a sit down event. Uh, it's a small church, so there are twenty people sitting down to morning tea, and they move around the table, and it's quite a, a big part of the thing. So those were all missing. Those things were missing, and Zoom only partly answered that it's better than nothing but it only partly answered that uh i'm not sure what other people did but we made millions well, not millions, well many many more phone calls during this pe period um just that was another way of communicating with people more personally and more at more length the spin-off of those was I found myself, I discovered I could make overseas telephone calls pretty cheaply. Um, so I now ring people overseas much more regularly, people I've had contact with. So contact was a big thing, I think. Yeah, yeah. You talked about, um, you, you know, the disorientation of suddenly doing things differently and, and, and those things that you missed, um, singing and, and that the cup of tea afterwards. Um, it, are there things about you know the, the Anglican aesthetic in terms of the way we worship that just don't translate uh, to the online space that that we just have to be in the same place for, or do you think there's ways around that so that uh, with a bit of imagination and creative creativity we can do Anglican worship online? Um, I seriously doubt it. <laughs> I, I... I mean, I, maybe I'm in the wrong generation, but I, I mean, I see that the value of all of the kinds of social connections that take place for other people, uh, for people uh, aside from church things. But there are elements to the church service which I think are really hard to do online. Silent prayer, I mean, the kind of silence that we often practice during the administration of communion, I don't know, People do different things, but um, the uh, the presence of other people doing things towards us, which is more in a kind of um, direct way. I just I don't know that you could do all of those things uh, online. Um, you could do some of them, and I suppose I I kind of feel that maybe the challenge for us now is to figure out which things are, can be well done online and which things need to be done in other ways in order to complement what's going on online. Because it's undoubtedly clear that um, 
there'll be many more church kind of services online as a result of COVID afterwards, I think. And there'll be many people who come to those who can't come to church. I mean, we had three nursing homes with people coming to church on, 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 on Zoom in our parish. They would never be able to come. Those people couldn't come normally to church. So they come and they participate in a wider community online. That's, that's a great plus, I think, for those kinds of people. I wonder if you know, one of the dangers of the online space is that um, it, it sort of heightens that sense of consumerism where I, I can get exactly the sort of preaching I want from wherever in the world I want, whenever I want, rather than having to go out of my way at a particular time to be with people that I might not ordinarily want to be with. Um, but so, so you talked about yeah, the importance of community. What does it mean when you know, we can choose exactly the sort of community we want on the terms that, that we bring? Um, yeah. Thank you. I, I mean, I agree with that, Jeremy. I think that that's a problem for us anyway, aside from COVID. Uh, I'm not so familiar with the demography of Brisbane, but in Sydney, of course, the, the, the socioeconomic columns that make up the uh, city means that uh, there are all sorts of... Um, uh, down here, people talk about the tribes that exist, and they're all kind of, they're kind of located. There's a certain tribe of people that live in the eastern suburbs, that there's a tribe that lives in the Shire, uh, there's a tribe, tribe that lives in Hunters Hill, and there's a tribe that lives at Rudy Hill and so forth. I, that sort of thing already exists on, for socioeconomic grounds. And, and that seems to me to challenge something about church and Catholicity, which is kind of unsatisfactory. So I, but I don't think that's peculiar to COVID, but I agree with you about the print, but that's a long running thing, you know. <laughs> When, when the Puritans went gadding after, after preachers in the, in the afternoon on Sundays, that's exactly what they were doing. They went to church in the morning, did the liturgy, and then went looking for a preacher that they really liked. Uh, wasn't a pattern that survived, and I'm sure it still happens. I mean, people, I think 30% of the people in our parish who come to church don't live in the parish, ter in the territorial parish. And I would have thought in a metropolitan city that's not unusual. No, that, that's true. It, it, as a child, I remember driving past five different parish, Anglican parish churches to go to the one that we went to as a family. So right. yeah. it has never been thus. Yeah. One of the, um, in one of the reflections, you, uh, you talk about uh, Stephen Langton. Um, and Langton was the one who first divided the Bible into orderly chapters instead of the sort of arbitrary continuous printing that it been you know characterized the text before that um i thought it interesting that you you encourage people to to read the text sometimes without reference to chapters and verses just you know particularly mark's gospel um but i thought one of the gifts of your reflections was that they they do punctuate you know a period of time when you know i think back over the last couple of years and it's it's kind of a blur and it's hard to distinguish one one month or or week from another right. um so i wonder if did you find that a useful discipline um you know just the discipline of of writing week by week um and thinking about you know length that's soon upon us and and the, the disciplines we're invited to during that time um how was that for you as a as a discipline was it something new or something that you're used to doing it was different but it was terrific i mean I didn't in any given week love it because I had a deadline <laughs> and a word count. But but over the year, it was a terrific experience. I mean, I, I look back on it as being probably one of the best things I got out of the COVID period uh, because it forced me um, to, to reflect on the week in some way which would be Christianly shareable with others and in a way which might be helpful for them. So that was a, that was a, I mean, for a theologian, that's a great challenge, you know, I mean, trying to think about what the, what the faith means in this week's events or whatever is, is the ultimate challenge. And I, I, I mean, I, how can I put it? 
mostly retrospectively, I loved it. Yeah. And and what other what other gifts were there for you during that time? So the, the gift of um, you know that weekly practice of, of writing. I, I know for for us uh, certainly I live in a cul-de-sac, and one of the great gifts of um, yeah the the time of lockdown was we all got to know each other a lot better because every Saturday morning someone would deliver baked goods to the front doorstep and we'd stand it in our driveways and have morning tea. Um, were there gifts for you during you know, that, that time? Yeah, we, we had just moved into an independent living retirement complex here in Paddington. Um, it's a terrific complex and we're very happy living here and the people in it are wonderful. Um, but COVID, COVID didn't help that a lot, I don't think, because restrictions that existed in these kinds of institutions uh, for the purpose of the regulations, your apartment was your home, not the corridor or the public rooms, but your apartment, which made the complex more, in a way, restrictive in that you couldn't stand out in the driveway. Uh, um, well, you could, that's what you could do, but you couldn't, it wouldn't be your driveway and people wouldn't come to it. And so it was a little, I didn't think it was very, yeah, I thought it was a bit restricting really. And it was, it did, it, the, it's a new complex and it only opened, uh, I guess, 18 months before COVID came. So a whole lot of new people were suddenly thrust together in this eight story building, which anyway, it's worked well, but I'm not sure that COVID contributed a lot to that. Mm. And, you know, that sense of, of isolation and, um, you know, the people talk about a pandemic of loneliness that, that's been sort of building for, for, for many years. Um, how, does, how does the church speak into that space? You know, we, we, um, you know there's been the challenge of, of COVID, but sort of moving forward, how do we, how do we speak into that? You know, that sense, and, and before we started, um, I asked if, you know, there was a sort of general sense of anxiety in Sydney as sort of restrictions are relaxed. Um, what is it that we have to say into that space as, as the church? Yeah, I think, I think, um, I think what, we, what we, we need to do is to establish connections which are loving and supportive. I, I had a funny experience in the second year. When was, where are we now, February? It's been last year. And I was feeling grumpy for a few weeks. <laughs> and, and I suddenly realized that actually I was slipping into some kind of depressive period. And it was because we had such restrictive contact and I stopped writing, which is always a bad sign and uh, found I couldn't think and did more and more useless things. And it, it kind of pulled me up short uh, and happily I'm married to a wonderful woman who knew how to handle that. But um, I think there will be a lot of people who don't get deeply depressed, but get depressed enough to be out of kilter with their lives. And having a network which is actively engaged in trying to keep in touch with people is a really important thing for the church to be doing. And not only people in the church in that regard, people in the community um, outside the church. I think, I think it's, it's, in a crisis, it's very easy for a church to kind of look after its own. But, but that's a kind of um, a trap for the purposes for which the church exists. And, and, and therefore the kind of stuff in our parish, for example, um, uh, there was set up a network of people who rang people and to get on the rung list you had to be in a nursing home or you had to be known to someone and this this group which probably had about 12 or 15 people in it who all knew about half a dozen people that ends up being a lot of people <laughs> and anyone could add anyone to that list or withdraw from that list, if you see what I mean. Um, 
I rang, a, I was put on the list and I rang one particular person whom so I knew and they said, oh, it's great to hear from you. No, no, I, no I'm, I'm very busy. Actually, I'm on the ringing list. You don't need to ring me. <laughs> um, so the list had to be kind of um, alive and monitored and maintained. And someone, there was some key person who was doing that in the parish. Now that list could be expanded easily and it was expanded to people who weren't people who came to church in the previous pre-COVID thing. So I, I thought that was a really good thing to do. It has a certain kind of artificiality about it because it's only ever a phone call, but phone calls often led to dropping fruit on the front doorstep or whatever, you know what I mean, the, depending on the circumstances. Um, I thought that was a good thing to do. And I think, I think that the church, it would be good if the church ran organized psychological help for centers of service and so forth. But actually I think on the ground, we have a parish system and the system is spread all over the place. And that's where the people are who need the help and why not use the system? I mean, you know, that's what it's, one of the things that it originally was doing. Mm. I, I, my, uh, my sense is that overwhelmingly, you know, parishes did a, a terrific job, as you say, of, of staying in touch with, with people in, who are already members of the parish. Uh, and there was some connection with people outside through some of the online stuff. But, you know, the, the sort of fear that haunted me was that if churches closed their doors, um, the rest of the world gets on with their business and doesn't actually notice um and and it is that question of how we do that outward engagement as well yeah um, that's the we, we at, at one stage through the COVID, we we were i was on a group which were planning a, an all-day forum because there were some stage at one stage in sydney there was a possibility of having big meetings and we've got a nice church hall at watson's bay so we we're going to have a couple of prominent speakers to talk about some issues which are quite important locally, uh, like uh, domestic violence and youth suicide. And, and to, just to raise that question and to invite people to come and talk about how we can locally deal with that. Alas, two weeks before the date of the thing, the clapper came down and there were no meetings allowed and so forth and anyway. And a key person who was involved in that group has now moved to Queensland. So, I'm, doubt, I'm no doubt she's in some parish church up there in the southern region. All oh, right, oh, very good. Um, as as we sort of emerge from from this time into whatever the the, the new normal looks like, are, are there is there wisdom from our tradition? You know, times where the church has been at a lower ebb than it is now, that we can look to and uh, and that might give us some direction or some hope or. Uh, what, what does the tradition offer us in that space? Hmm. Um, that's a nice question, Jeremy. I have to think a little bit. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I think the, the tradition, depending on how far you go back, uh, what it has been English shaped and Christendom shaped. So it's, it's, we've kind of risen and fallen with the tide and the waves along with the community around us. If you stretch outside that into the last 150 years, um, the tradition has been much more aggressive uh, in terms of location and interaction. Um, uh, in Africa, for example, uh, Anglican churches uh, tap into uh, social networks much more than I think is the case and much more energetically and actively. Um, and I think they do that via the existing active social networks that exist. Social networks in Africa, in large parts of Africa, are, um, are life-sustaining networks, basically, uh, rather than life-enjoying ones. And uh, therefore, they're more, they're more active and more significant. And the churches, my observation, the African church, when I was doing that kind of stuff was that they seem to capitalize on those networks probably more than the static the more static kind of established parish churches in England or in 
Australia. Mm. I think I think I think I would be looking for help from the newer Anglican churches. So that sounds like a downer on the English church. <laughs> I lived in England and taught in England for 15 years and I love the English church. I always <laughs> I have lots of friends there, but and they are so creative. It always amazes me. The English, every now and again, they come up with something extraordinarily creative. But in this instance, I'd be looking at the African and South American, less so the Asian churches. Yeah, yeah terrific. So just to, to, to pivot slightly and to, to pick up some of the comments in the chat, um, Bruce, did you want to say, Bruce Bowes, did you want to say uh, something uh, more about um, the sacrament and, and, and your experience of that in the online space? And you might have a question to go with that or just a reflection. Um, thank you. Thank you, Bruce. The, yeah, but I just, one of the, the um, yearnings from my parish is um, for the blood of Christ, for the cup. Uh, we haven't been able to do that. We haven't able to share the cup since um, since COVID uh, began, and um, they, there is a real yearning and a, and a, like a, a need, not just a yeah, it's a definite need. You're just breaking up a bit there, Bruce. Yeah, I got a thing to say when my internet was uh, unstable, and I can't understand that. It's a really good internet, but. Um, it, it's so um, one thing you can't do online is share the sacrament um, and people really were very very keen to come back into the churches to actually partake and um, and, and find with with the uh, of one kind it's been um, right but as I said there's a real yearning there for that need for the two clients. Um, well, yeah, I understand that. And certainly uh, some churches here in Sydney experience that as well. Not all, but some. And that's a different edge of the tradition. Um, but, uh, and also some conducted the Eucharist online so that you had the people at home handling the elements this is a hotly contested thing i can tell you i've just got a book to review which has a chapter on it attacking that whole thing <laughs> by a very well-known liturgiologist and scholar down in canberra i won't um but uh some parishes did that and i think that ameliorated their concerns but in the end if you can't do it you can't do it can you bruce that's true yeah and so the question then becomes well okay how do we how do we deal with that? How do we pe help people to deal with what it was that they got from being participants in the Eucharist or uh, presumably, I guess? Um, how can we help them to uh, sustain their Christian lives without that? And that requires a fair bit of imagination and lateral thinking and thinking about other things, not thinking that you might do a substitute online, which might be second rate and not do what you want to do and somehow deny some things that are involved in the sacrament. So I think you, you have to kind of find a way around the reality if you can't change it. I mean, it kind of reminds me of um, a, a session I went to once about anxiety for business people. Uh, and they said, if you're in a traffic jam and you're already 20 minutes late for your appointment, there is absolutely nothing you can do about it. So don't try and get to your meeting on time. So the, what the advice was, if, if the reality is there and you can do nothing about it, you have to find a way of getting around it uh, and not get stuck on the fact that it's not available. Um, and I think, I think that can vary from place to place. I mean, it may be that depending on the circumstances, combined household Eucharists might be something to be thought about or even household eucharists um it's a long tradition of those in the church 
Yeah. Um, I don't mean households running it. I mean, are you a parish priest? Yes. Yes, yes you're doing them. Mm. Uh, that's a thought. We'd be uh, sharing things, of course, still, wouldn't we? That's, um, and uh, at the moment, what, that, what sort of push? Is the yearning still here? It's unrequited, and it'll probably remain unrequited for um, just like things but, uh, and, and living with it. What made it possible to live with us was, was the fact that every so often, especially here in Queensland, there would be another lockdown or another uh, surge or something like that. And that would, that would just bring home to the fact that asked to us reasons why we were doing it. Yeah. It would help. It certainly would help. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Household Eucharists, I'm not sure. You don't take Eucharist into the households? Only of one kind. Only? Of one kind. Don't take oh, Okay. Well, I mean, I don't want to entertain that discussion, but I mean, that's that's one way of, I mean, if that's the way you do it, that's the way you do it. And at the moment, uh, because of, well, it may be easy next week for us here in Queensland, but because of Omicron, my, uh, the ones that I would normally go into the home are at risk, and so I'm sort of not going into them. Yeah, right. So, I wonder, oh, sorry, Chris, I, I was going to invite Imelda, uh, she's got a, a question in that same sort of space. Uh, so, Imelda uh, Lachlan, if you wanted to ask your question or share your reflection. Uh, thanks, Jeremy. Um, I, I agree there is a great yearning uh, to share the cup and it raises the question of um, you know, am I privileged as the celebrating priest in being able to um, receive the, the blood of Christ? Um, I don't know the answer. Um, whenever I get, I, I guess, when I get distressed about it, the thing that always comes back to me is that we are celebrating as a community. Um, it's a community of people that come together in uh, faith and love. And if as a celebrating priest, I wasn't receiving the blood of Christ, then I presume the community wouldn't be. So that's what keeps me going. But I agree there, there's, um, there's a dilemma, there's a great question around it and there's a great longing and yearning mm. um, for what we don't have at the moment yeah i think that's a really interesting question about what do you as a priest do when you're not able to preside and uh, administer communion to your people yes yeah i don't have much to add you're wondering about I that. Um, any thought that sometimes I, I mean, it's just that actually sharing of the wondering yeah. that um, allows the spirit in and that leads us to something more. The only thing that occurs to me, and I'm, I'm not in that situation, but would be to think if the people suffer in this way, why shouldn't I suffer with them? Yes. Uh, so that you then create that aspect of the community which you're serving but i guess there are a lot of there are a lot of currents in this question aren't there about uh, your own personal practices uh, and the practices of the congregation but i mean it would you know that would be an, that, that was the only thing i've thought of as you were talking was i think if i were in that situation i might consider at least putting myself in the position of the community with them yeah, I understand what you're saying, and I have often thought about that as well. Mm. Like, if they're suffering, why shouldn't I suffer with them? But I'm drawn back to, if I don't, as the celebrating priest, if I don't include that um, as part of our Eucharist, then it's not there. Can you elaborate uh, that a bit for me? 
Um, when I celebrate the Eucharist, I'm not sensing that it's necessarily um, about me. Uh, in fact, I love the opportunity to actually be part of the worshipping congregation rather than the celebrating priest. So the dilemma that I bring to the altar is, well, will I say, um, I will forego what you forego, but then what do we as a community forego? You forego what you jointly are foregoing. The Eucharist is suspended. Okay, I hear you. I mean, that's the reality um, of that action, isn't it? I hear you and I need to reflect on that. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thanks, Amelda. Kathy uh, Laufer. Right. Thanks, Jeremy. Hello, Bruce. Good to see Hello. you. Hello. <laughs> um, oh, Kathy Laufer. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear that correctly. Hi. Um, I think there's a couple of things that we need to remember here in terms of the Eucharist. The first is that it's an incarnational act. So when we say that the incarnation is about physicality, it is about God becoming enfleshed. So the Eucharist is a physical act. It's about stuff for want of a better word. That's the first thing we need to remember and that's why I am trying to consecrate through the ether is problematic to say to at the put least it. yeah at the least at the least the other thing that is in book that I think we need to remember is that Eucharist is a communal act. It is about community. That's why we say just before the great Thanksgiving, we are the body of Christ. His spirit is with us. And it is as community that we celebrate and that we receive. One of the things that was really significant in my community, my parish, is that in the midst of COVID, a significant member of the community died. And I went to take her, take communion to her at her bedside and her family were around her. She could not physically receive because of the nature of her cancer at the time and this was a day or two before she went to God but she received on a spiritual level and I spoke about that in a sermon and also wrote about it in our parish newsletter and it changed the way people understood what was happening they suddenly realized that even if I as an individual, am not receiving the cup, I, as part of this community of faith, am receiving the cup when another member of the community of faith receives it. So that's it's, a modification on your second point. Yes, that it's about that we celebrate Eucharist as community, not as individuals. That's one of the reasons why in the Reformation, it, we were, it became very clear the priests were not to have private Eucharist, private masses, all on their own. Son. Yeah. Well, I, I, I mean, Kathy, <laughs> it's nice to hear you again. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, um, I mean, I, the points that you're just making are not dissimilar from the ones that have just been made. Uh, and, and and shape the problem of COVID and whether or not you can have communions in different kinds of ways. But your example is an example of, uh, how can I put this, uh, a locationally 
and relationally intensified version of an online Eucharist. Is it? <laughs> isn't it? And 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 isn't and and, and 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 kind of another version of that is people for whom we take the reserve sacrament, to whom we take the reserve sacrament. So, I mean, I think the two points are absolutely right. It's a material thing and it's a community thing. Um, but, but like a lot of other things, it, there's some greys in there which are eminently sensible. The question is, what degree of grey can you handle in this way? And, and I think um, it's usually not very much. <laughs> That's my feeling about it. I mean, and I think, I think I'm think i drawn to uh, all out, uh, one, uh, one out, all out kind of thing. I mean, if the community can't have Eucharist, then I think maybe the clergy ought to be representatively identifying with them. So I've hardened up since my last conversation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks. And thanks, Kathy, for that. Uh, I can see uh, John McNamee has his hand raised. John, have you got a question or a or a comment. John, you'll need to unmute yourself. He may have gone. Oh, there you go. uh, yes, I just want to make a comment on that. Uh, recently, I was reading an article written by Peter Carnley, and it's called In the Eucharist Use of the Common Cop, Common Common Cup. And um, I think that's probably a good article to read and reflect on. Doesn't matter whether you agree with everything or not, but to watch the way that he has argued this point. And I think that would be very helpful, particularly in this part of the discussion where we're uh, considering all these different things. And he was particularly concerned about the use of individual cuffs for communion. But when you look behind that, there's a lot of the theology with uh, communion, with celebrating it, and with um, the way that people uh, use that. And um, if I can just take a question on the end of it, uh, how much of it is particularly Anglican and how much of it is completely scriptural? Okay, thanks. <laughs> thanks, John. Uh, I'm not sure how to answer that question. Um, I, I think the question only makes sense in a way if you, you say, is, it, is this the way that we do it in Anglicanism? Um, since the whole structure of institutionality that surrounds what we do wasn't there in the first century. Um, but it is, what you say is correct about uh, our Anglican tradition, that that's the way we have done it in the past. We haven't always um, communicated in both kinds, of course, in the history of Anglicanism. Uh, and in many places, um, the cup is not extended as a cup, but is, 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 is the vehicle for providing intinctured wafers. And that's quite widespread uh, in the Anglican communion around the world. Um, so uh, the tradition of the common cup is strong, but not universal, I think. Uh, and, and the point of it is to, I guess, is to do two things. One, to replicate what presumably took place at the Last Supper and, and to make a, and to draw, draw a line or an image about the, the communal character of this uh, sacrament. And both those things are worth underlining. Um, uh, but, but, you know, there are practical questions about the common cup in relation to capacity, illness, and so on and so forth. I remember when HIV AIDS first began to emerge, there was a lot of discussion about the effect of the common cup on the spread of AIDS. Um, and a lot of medical things were written, none of which I think settled the question. Um, uh, and I think a lot of people in that context did use tinctured wafers as a way of doing it. I, I think, I think, um, I think the common cup uh, is difficult practically in large environments. Though I have to say, having said that, 
I went to the General Convention in Episcopal Church back in 2000 and something, and it was held in Denver, Colorado, and they had daily Eucharist in the morning, to which about 3,000 people turned up. Uh, the General Convention is a, is a kind of like a, a bazaar. All sorts of people come to it, but don't take part in the debates. Uh, and they communicated 3,000 people. It's an American organization. They communicated 3,000 people in this huge hall in a matter of about 20 minutes. I couldn't believe it. I mean, they had, I don't know how many stations they had, but they, 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 they kind of had a common cup, but it really wasn't a common cup. I don't know. I'm rambling. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm, right. I'm kind well, of, yeah. kind of... I, I was going to say, you know, one of the one of the things about this COVID time is that it's, it's focused a whole lot of these conversations that kind of bubbled away uh, in the life of the church, and suddenly, for for different reasons, you know, we're talking about the common cup in a way that we we weren't, you know, three or four years ago, and uh, you know, we're talking about um, online worship in a way that we we haven't before. Yeah. Um, and, and so, you know, this time of COVID really has focused a whole lot of questions yeah. for us as a church. And, and I don't know what the experience more broadly is, but certainly anecdotally um, across denominations um, in Queensland, um, you know, attendances are down between by between 20 and 30 percent. And um, so there's some focused questions about viability that you know been bubbling away for a while but suddenly uh, are more focused um, so i guess you know as as we come to a, a close I, I guess a question would be um you know what is it that we might learn from this time to take forward um you know as a church um we've had some focused conversations about all sorts of things in a way that we haven't before and you know, some things have seemed more urgent. Um, but what's your sense of what we might uh, learn as a church from, from this time? Um, well, a couple of things, just taking up the line of the conversation just now. I think, I think the discussion of the Eucharist highlights an issue as to whether we think of the Eucharist as an individual activity for the lay people to come forward and receive or a community activity, as has been underlined, um, which 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 is a kind of expression of community activity. I mean, I would put my money on the second point rather than the first, but it does affect then the way in which you think about the common cup or the separate little whatever they are. Um, I think, um, Jeremy, in terms of what might be learned, I think the question of the character of the Christian community in the parish and its relationship to the wider social community is an issue which has been really sharply highlighted by COVID. Uh, how we function as a community, which can be in service to the wider yeah. community and to our neighbours, is, I think, underlies a lot of it. Uh, for me personally, I, th I think also there are things to be learned about patience. There's a lot of patience in my book. Uh, and I think that's got a lot to do with how we think about our Christian lives. Um, uh, there's a wonderful book which I read a few years ago by a guy called Alan Kreider called The Patient Ferment of the Early Church. Um, and he's got a little chapter at the end called The Impatience of Constantine. Uh, the Christian life uh, is a life lived in faith and in Paul's terms, one that is shaped by the kingdom of God, which is in heaven, not here. Our citizenship is in heaven not here. So what we do here is in a way contingent. It's kind of always going to be temporary in a way. It's not, it's not, it's, it's not absolute in a way in which, um, uh, to pick up Kathy's thing, it's not in the way in which the incarnation is. There's not a, there's not a sense in which um, our practices have absolute standing they are there to serve the purposes of people living christian lives being witnesses to christ and so on and growing in faith now i i think what covid covid has demanded immense patience from the population at large i mean compliance is another word for i mean compliance doesn't work unless you've got some kind of patience and the christian ought to be a 
a paradigm example of patience because they don't, a, uh, whether, I can't remember the exact words of the epistle of Diognetus in the second century, but it's about how we are citizens of this country, but citizens of a country, but of none. And, and um, it's like Jesus answered a pilot, are you, is you, my kingdom is not of this world, else would my disciples fight? That's the alternative between patience, waiting upon what God will provide and living a godly life, the alternative is fighting. And uh, I think that COVID may be a good way of, uh, may, could have been a good way or could might be a good way of us learning more about the character and origins of the patience, which is so much a mark of the early Christian literature. Patience. Well, Bruce, thank you so much uh, for that. I, I wanted to finish um, by sharing uh, the, the closing words in, in the book, um, which is the, the piece from Patrick's Breastplate. So as a, as a prayer, as we finish, I bind unto myself today the power of God to hold and lead, his eye to watch, his might to stay, his ear to hearken to my need. The wisdom of my God to teach, his hand to guide, his shield to ward, the word of God to give me speech, his heavenly host to be my guard. Amen.